Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Karen Carboner, and I am the president of the Walt Whitman Initiative, a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission it is to celebrate New York City's literary legacy and serve as an organizing center for cultural activism and poetry related events, such as the one you're about to enjoy. Please follow us on Facebook and Instagram and tune into our YouTube channel to explore more presentations in our robust American Love Speaker series. Uh, if you like what we're doing, there are many ways to support our programs and our initiatives. Please visit our website to find out how, or you can simply write to Walt, walt at waltwhitmaninitiative.org. We decided to offer the speaker series, and please note the word speaker, not lecture or lecturer, to present timely public-facing conversations on Whitman's life, work, and legacy. You'll hear conversations and enjoy presentations by teachers, poets, graduate students, artists, printers, neighborhood activists, you name it. They're not designed to be academic talks, but free, open, informal discussions that we end by inviting your questions for a Q&A with our speakers. So if you're watching on YouTube right now, please make sure to post your questions in the chat section. If you miss one of our events, you can always catch them on the Walt Whitman Initiative's YouTube channel. And if you'd like to know what's coming up, just check out our website, waltwhitmaninitiative.org. And just a word on that, we are taking a break next week uh, for the first time since we started the series, we had a lot of people who did not feel comfortable presenting the, the week before election day. Go figure. So we're gonna maintain that nice silence, hopefully come out of it with flying colors. And November 5th, we will have a master printer with us, Barbara Henry, one of my very favorite artists, will be presenting on Whitman, the printer poet. Furthermore, she'll be taking us into her studio uh, she is a letterpress artist and she runs her own press called Harsimus Press in Pennsylvania. And Barbara will be taking us behind the scenes and giving us a look at Whitman's work from the inside. So please come join us November 5th, always on Thursdays, six o'clock Eastern time. Uh, the next week, November 11th, I'm very excited to have Karen Coonrod, the director of Campania de Columbari, come on and talk about performing Whitman. Many of you have heard of her show, More or Less I Am. It's an extraordinary experiential uh, reinterpretation of lines from Song of Myself. It involves the audience. You are part of the production. There are many, many performers involved, musicians as well as singers. Uh, it is an overwhelming good feeling that you get from a show like that. Um, and Karen will talk about that production, which has been going on for over 10 years. So please join us for those uh, upcoming events. Very excited about that. And super duper excited to present two of my very favorite people today, Barbara Baer from the Library of Congress and Wally Suffolk, one of my most beloved students ever. Um, I have good stories to tell about both of these folks. And I wanna introduce what we're going to do today. If you teach, if you teach Whitman specifically, you're gonna really enjoy this presentation. We're gonna take you into the Library of Congress because we have the keeper of the gate here with us, Barbara Baer, who works on collaborative projects in the digital humanities, exhibitions and outreach as a historian at the Library of Congress, where she curates collections in literature, culture, and the arts in the manuscript division. She's taught Whitman in American studies courses at the University of California, Santa Cruz and Brown University. And she has also curated a number of Whitman ex exhibitions. If you've been to the Library of Congress and seen any of these, you will know uh, Barbara from the inside. She is not only a superb historian and writer, uh, and we've worked together on that Barbara, I know um, many times, uh, but she also really knows her Whitman. So I can't think of anyone better to introduce us to the digital archives at the Library of Congress than Barbara Baer. Barbara, welcome to the show and thank you so much for coming today. Oh, thank you. So good to see you and so good to see Wally who is a, well, he's many, many things besides a really dear friend, writer, law lawyer, journalist, 
community organizer, and queer rights activist. Uh, he's based now in New York City, though he's lived internationally. Um, he's been recognized by the Financial Times and Yahoo Finance as a global top five outstanding LGBT plus future leader in 2018 and 2019. Uh, Wally has 15 years of experience in the legal and finance industry in New York and Hong Kong. He is currently following his passion by pursuing creative writing and literature studies at Columbia University. And I have to stop there because it is sort of a fairy tale story, Wally. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's so exciting. It's such a pleasure. Oh, and uh, Wally and I recently reconnected. Uh, we have to tell our entire story to the audience, but I just wanted to back up to, to what I just said. Um, Wally, as, as you and I know, you had a very successful career as a lawyer, internationally uh, very well known, um, and, and uh, brought that kind of uh, legal expertise to activism as well. And now you've kind of taken a time out, or I guess, really retired from law to pursue creative writing. Is that right? That's right. I think I found my calling or at least want to explore that creative side in me. You know, there's a saying about the law abhorring creativity. Uh, so this is, me, you know, trying to get back in touch with that creative side, but, but still maintaining that analytical um, legal side. I don't think we ever lose that. So yeah. Right, and it's such a wonderful, powerful combination. I can't wait to see what you do. I mentioned that I know Wally since fall, fall 2000 because he was my student at Columbia University when I was still a grad student there. And Wally was a star student in a core class at Columbia called Literature Humanities. Um, and Wally, do you wanna talk a little bit about that and how we wound up getting back together 20 years later? <laughs> Sure, sure. Just, just quickly, this is a literature humanities class. It's a class that all undergraduate students at, at Columbia have to take. And um, I was fortunate enough to have the, the class um, be in the section with Karen. And if I'm not mistaken, Karen, um, you snuck in Whitman to the syllabus, um, course, you know? <laughs> I love that, I love that, you know, because there was a, a standardized reading list that all undergrads had to, to read and you being a Whitman scholar, you're like, you gotta put in Leaves of Grass. And that was really my introduction to Whitman. I think I had read Song of Myself in high school, but it was great to revisit that. And one of my fondest, fondest memories from college was the field trip that you took us on to the Brooklyn Bridge, where we took our, our copies of Leaves of Brass, crossed the Brooklyn Bridge from the Manhattan side to Brooklyn, and we read and discussed Whitman's poems, um, including Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. So that was just an amazing experience. And then, of course, now that I'm trying to explore writing, it was great that um, to find you again and see that you're still teaching Whitman and to have the opportunity to get to take a full Whitman class with you over the summer was, was such a privilege. And so I think I'm, I'm now, um, you know, a super Whit maniac, a Karen maniac, <laughs> um, and just really excited about um, exploring Whitman further even. So yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Wally. Any teacher out there knows that the privilege and the honor is the teachers to have a student like Wally. And Wally was, as I said, this phenomenal student. I will never forget his reading of uh, I Sit and Look Out at the Brooklyn Bridge in the fall of 2000. And when he came back and took my Whitman class, I teach a, a Whitman class at Columbia during the summertime. Um, I couldn't believe that I got an email and I, I thought, I know this name. I know this guy, Wally. I said it to my husband and he's like, hey, how could you know him? And sure enough, it was the same student that I had had 20 years before. Think about the privilege of knowing someone and someone so talented over that course of time and being lucky enough to see him at the outset and then at a crux moment in your life where you're really kind of shifting gears sort of back in the direction of literature humanities, right? Thinking about a career in literature and writing. 
Um, so really, really amazing to connect with Wally. And Wally is here uh, because he, it, he was a student and he was a respondent to um, an exercise that I gave this summer on the Library of Congress digital collections. We had a remote class this summer, first time that I taught this class remotely, and we had to use digital resources. Luckily, as Barbara knows, and she's very greatly responsible for, much of the very important Whitman collection at the Library of Congress is actually accessible online. And actually, Barbara, I wanted to ask you that question. How much of let's say the Feinberg Whitman collection, which is, I guess, the Library of Congress's biggest Whitman collection. How much of that is digitized? Um, most of it, uh, Feinberg, everything is digitized, I believe. Wow. wow. There's a part of the Harned collection that is not, but. Okay, so yeah. the Library of Congress does not only have the largest Whitman collection, it has been actively digitizing that collection. And it's great for scholars, but it's also great for just ordinary folks who are really interested in diving into Whitman's life and work and legacy. And that's what we're here to, to speak with you about. Barbara is going to introduce those digital collections. Very handy for those of you that are teaching and learning online right now. And then we're going to run through this possible assignment that you're welcome to recycle. Uh, and Wally wrote an absolutely stellar analysis will take us through his points of thinking in looking at the very precious Crossing Fr Brooklyn Ferry Notebook that Whitman maintained in the 1850s while he was thinking about and getting together the words and the ideas for his most seminal New York poem, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. So very excited to talk to both of you about this. And I feel like we've kind of introduced you, um, you know, but I, I'd love to hear more. Barbara, I know that you have a big announcement, also uh, education related to share. And I, I also would be really curious to hear what brought you to Whitman, because I actually don't know that story. Well, what brought me to Whitman was the availability of a public library in my hometown. Because mm -hmm. as a little girl in the summer, uh, when I was eight going on nine, I began walking to the public library and they had this area of picture books basically with tables. And I chose three books by their covers that were beautiful. And I remember the day I sat down, the light was coming through the window and the three books were Song of Myself, a collection on Van Gogh's paintings of nature and Alfred Stieglitz's photographs of New York and, and Lake George. Wow, and, how old were you when you chose those books? <laughs> I was um, almost nine. Oh yeah. my God, that's amazing. I have a nine-year-old at home and I hope she's listening to this show. <laughs> Very inspirational. But it was a seminal moment in retrospect because it, in some ways my future life was there on the table. And uh, my, so my original engagement with Whitman, that was the first day I read Song of Myself. And it just reinforced for me the way I was already looking at the world, I, that when I would walk through the, the town and the city and look at the trees and the stones, everything seemed alive to me. And that is also true of Van Gogh's paintings, every atom. And that element was so beautifully expressed by Walt Whitman. And I think before that, you know, the primary literary sort of influences for me were the revised standard version of the Bible and hymns and songs. And this was a new kind of religiosity that I really responded to. And I thought, here it is. This is the new Bible. It's all spread out here for me in association with these beautiful paintings and photographs. And when I first taught Whitman, I taught it in an introduction to American studies class. And I did every unit with a combination of cultural um, interdisciplinary cultural sources. So I taught Whitman in the Civil War in association with Matthew Brady and, and um, Alexander Gardner's um, uh, photographs. And then um, also part of the urban history with uh, the Poems of New York and the Ashcan School and Lewis Hine and Jacob Reese's photographs of New York. 
So again, it was kind of that early table full of books and then it became a class. And then it turned out um, much to my surprise really that this is what I'm doing now for a living. So. Yeah, lucky you. I mean, the the (laughs) theme is realized, uh, such a moving story. And can you just, because not everybody will know what you do. Could you take us, what's a typical day like in terms of what you're asked to do at the Library of Congress? Well, I'm one of several historians, there are nine of us, like the Supreme Court. And um, (laughs) we each have a subject specialty or a period of history that we specialize in and we oversee those collections. And we are responsible for the acquisition. So we build the, the, um, we do collection development for the library. And we do a lot of programming, special events, tabletop exhibits, exhibits in the cases, working with the exhibits office, um, lecture programs and scholarly panels, things like that. And the book, I know you were very busy with that at the end of September, right? The the National Festival. Well, the, the library, yes, with the National Book Festival. And um, you know, during Whitman's um, birthday s- celebration, we had several events at the library of different kinds, um, including an event in the uh, children's literature section and um, uh, a special display and a tabletop exhibit. So, and we, we kind of partnered with the Folger Library on that. So people could walk from the library to another library and, and um, it culminated, the festival culminated with a a poetry program at the Folger. So a lot of variety. And the other part that we all do, those of us who have my same position as historians, um, is that we do basically kind of advanced reference. We help people who are writing books, who are filmmakers who are making films, journalists who are writing stories, um, documentary filmmakers, all all a variety of, of scholars of all different kinds. And also, you know, anyone who comes into the reading room who has a special um, need to see the physical item in a collection or anything like that. So what we do day to day may vary, but those are the kind of three sections of our our job description. Such a dream job. And I know that when Wally, when I connected the three of us about this talk today, Wally, I know you are working on a play about that famous meeting of Oscar Wilde and Walt Whitman later in Whitman's life. And it didn't take Barbara long until she started turning you on to resource after resource. And I was like, well, this is a great triangle here. Um, (laughs) Wally, do you want to tell us a little bit about your project and like what you're doing now, you know, leaving the legal profession behind and really plunging now into creative exploration? Sure, sure. And, and later, Barbara, I have to ask you, I'll have to ask you after this, like which Supreme Court justice you would be, uh, if you could choose one. Um, <laughs> but I, I hope you'll get you, my lace collar. I'll be right back. <laughs> R.I.P. Ginsburg, yes. Um, and, and the religion of, of Whitman. I, I, I love that. Um, yeah, so, you know, I've, I've, I've taken a pause in my legal career. I, I think um, that, well, I think what this year has really shown me, I made, I made this decision last year, but I think this year, given all the things that's happening, um, I think we, we need things to nourish the soul, right? We, we need things to, um, to provide comfort. And I, I think the arts and poetry um, can, can fill some of that, that need. Um, so it's been just really great. Um, coming to, to writing and exploring these great poets and, and writers, including Whitman. Um, I have to say that- Sounds like you're uh, qu- quoting from the preface to Leaves of Grass, America needs poets. Right? Yes. The poets yes. shall, Barbara, do you remember the quote? The poets shall something do more than their the, the presidents will, so. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and then in regards to this, this uh, play that I'm working on, yeah, thanks so much, Barbara and, and Karen, for, for your steer. So yeah, I'm a, and I think this has been done before, as, as Karen separately pointed out. It's, it's um, just working on a play about the encounter between Whitman and Oscar Wilde. And what I'm really interested in, in doing is, is using some of their writings, right? Um, some of their poetry, novels, plays, and incorporating that into a, a fictional um, dialogue. So, and so how to incorporate that. And uh, yeah, I think what, 
the archives have been amazing for that. And I think I'll, I'll of course not use 100% of what I find, but it's it's great to have the, the access to it. I think as, as artists, we, we who are doing nonfiction work, for example, um, we want to be able to rely on, on the archives and see what's out there and then sift through it and pick and choose. So in the end, we might only use like 10% of what we find, but it's, it's the part that we, we, we know what's out there. That's the important part um, of it, so yeah. And that can be manuscripts as well as images, right? Because that's what's wonderful, especially about bigger collections like the Feinberg at Library of Congress. You have so many different materials to look at um, and such rich subject matter with Oscar Wilde and Walt Whitman. So that sounds very exciting. We will sit tight and wait for that. And then meanwhile, I know you've been taking classes. How, how's that feeling, just sitting back from, from actually sort of a working idea and, and being on the other side of a desk? Like, how are you doing as a student these days? Um, yeah, Ooh, that, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, I, I was just talking. <laughs> you don't have to answer it if it's complicated. I was just talking about this in, in a class. Um, I think as, as, as writers, we are forced to actually confront ourselves every single day. Every part of that's part of the job is to to, to process process what's outside and then what, what's in our minds. Whereas in my you know old job, um, it was almost an escape, right? I, I could like be drafting a contract or drafting a a compliance policy, for example, and and not really have to look at myself and, and the world, right? Um, so I think, yeah, this is an interesting space to, to be in, to, to confront things head on. Um, and it's an interesting time to, to be doing all, all that. Right, at, the, at this time of crisis, right? But also, I guess, in your own life span, right? To take that break now, you know, after 20 years of really being out there and reassess, look internally and be able to express. Uh, I know you've been carrying with you that talent all of this time and you've applied that talent in different ways. So I'm, I'm just amazed and, and uh, you know, delighted to see how things have worked out for you. It's, it really is a teacher's privilege to see it, Wally. Uh, oh. Oh yeah, no, and I mean, I mean every word. And Wally has been talking about the importance of the archives, even creatively. And I guess that's really why we're here, Barbara, right? Like, because as you say, a lot of the people that you advise aren't just scholars, but maybe a writer who comes in and wants to see a document. Um, you have an announcement about a project in the, in, the, in the digital archive, is that right? Well, one of our new, um projects at the Library of Congress is called By the People, and it's the crowdsourcing transcription project. And if I do a little set of slides, I have a couple of examples of what it looks like. But basically anyone can sign up that has internet access. It's um, very democratic with a small d. And it's a way to get very up close and personal um, to archival materials. And we have what we call a Whitman campaign. And we, it was the very first by the people project and it was uh, launched for the birthday celebration. And we did two projects that are now finished. One is all of the Whitman, Walt Whitman miscellaneous manuscript collection is now transcribed in, in a just crowdsourcing way. You know, and, just because I'm not sure if everybody knows what a transcription is and we will talk about it extensively today. Maybe you could clarify what you mean by a transcription pro project? A transcription is when you read a primary document and you uh, type up basically what it says and so that it, it makes it easy to read the transcript. Which is and, easier um, than done, right? Because like it's a, a question of paleography, in other words, being able to read someone's handwriting you know, to translate little mistakes and to see if something is crossed out, whether you actually use it. So it's much, it's much more difficult than one would imagine to transcribe it, documents. It is much more difficult. And um, someone like Whitman is particularly difficult, not just, I mean, he has beautiful handwriting, 
but because he was constantly revising himself. And so there are cross outs and there are, um, you know, collage like paste of together. It's like, where would you put this piece of paper he stuck on the side of this? Where does it go? And, um, and then often he would reuse printed versions of something he'd written and then rewrite them by hand. And so to show all those changes in ellipses and so on, and, and what's inserted above the line, it can be very complex. And also the issue of, you know, what's been scratched out, what you can read of it. And, and sometimes with some people it is, you can't read their handwriting until, it, often what happens is there's this magical moment when it's, I, I remember this with Charles Sumner. Charles Sumner has very bad handwriting. And all of a sudden I could read it. And so part of it is the familiarity of looking very closely. And it's like almost like getting to know another human being that you see this handwriting and it's like the breaking of a code. Um, it was a mystery before and all of a sudden it's clear to you and you're understanding how they're expressing themselves. So one of the beauties of the Whitman material, we did the poetry section of the Feinberg and now we're doing the prose section. So we're working on the literary file. So people can go on right now and work on the prose. But when we were doing the poetry, we um, did some webinars and one of them was um, with the National Council for Teachers of English. And uh, the president of, of the NCT, um, Alfredo Lujan talked about how he uses Whitman in the classroom and um, the sort of a deep dive into the poetry. And then people talked about how moved they were when they were transcribing Whitman, sitting at home alone in COVID situations and that feeling of, I'm practically writing on top of Whitman's hand, these things that Whitman wrote and I'm understanding his creative thought process by doing something myself with my hands. You know, there's all this research that what we see with our, if we listen or what we see is different than if we write notes, you know, speaking of, of students in classes, that's right. a different part of our brain that we're using. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens in transcription. Mm -hmm. So there's a real intimacy to it and um, a beauty. And that's a part of the democracy aspect. It's a, this is a very grassroots, um, and we do have a, a technological uh, ulterior motive, which is when everything is transcribed, we're going to import those transcripts into the digital presentations of the documents. And so people would be able to toggle back and forth between the primary document and the transcription to help. Which is fabulous. Um, it also, yeah, that because so much of the material as we'll look at in a second, it's very hard to read, right? And the notes on these things are often quite limited. So to have yeah. the transcriptions and, and you know get a leg up on Whitman's handwriting and really figuring out what things say, that's invaluable. And the other thing it will give us is keyword searching. So it'll, it'll be a much, um, it will improve the granule level of the the access, and we're all about public access at the library. We're, you know, the greatest public library in the United States, and it's all about making things available free to whoever wants to access these materials. So this is all about trying to get the material out there, especially for people who can't physically come to the library, which ironically is everyone right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, are you even going into the library for work? I still teleworking and I go in occasionally on the intermittent basis to do exhibit work, but, but the, some of our reference librarians are working a partial schedule now. We're kind of easing back into how, how many staff are on site at a time. So just one more time about where folks can go if they are interested in the transcription project. It's called By the People. And um, if you go to the Library of Congress um, website, uh, you can type it in as a search and you'll come up with it. Also, if I do show the slides, I have a little slide with the URL. So. Terrific. Yes. And yeah. if, you, if you'd like to start with that, we'd love to see them. I know you have in mind to just introduce us to these rich digital resources that we've been talking about. So I'll let you take over the share screen mode. Okay, let's try it.
There we go. I think just one more to the right. Yes, exactly. Great. Now I don't know how to go backwards. So this is actually the second slide, but that's okay. Okay. Maybe if no. the space bar, the other, the, you know, the, oh, you're not using a Mac, right? Yeah, this is okay. We can start here just right. for the interest of time. So the first slide was basically showing all the different kinds of Whitman objects that are from all over the special collections parts of the library. We have uh, rare books, we have music, we have um, uh, photographs, manuscripts, broadsides, printed material, uh, all the first editions of Leaves of Grass, editions of Leaves of Grass in foreign languages from around the globe, just a wealth of materials that people can come and use. And we often show them in exhibits and try to make them um, available for people to see. And with the COVID conditions, we're more and more reliant on what's online. And we do have you know, more than 30,000 objects that are available digitally. So one of the places I wanna encourage people to go is to our prints and photographs online catalog. And what you're seeing on the screen is a kind of grid. If you typed in Whitman, this is the result you would get it in grid mode. And it's, you know, one of the things we had talked about in preparation for um, doing this program was the idea of Whitman and the body. So here is Whitman's body in many, many forms. And um, one, you know, possible classroom kind of exercise is to look at him as he changed over time, how he styled himself. And there's quite a bit of wonderful literature out there about the choices that he made for frontispieces for um, leaves of grass and so on. So those are wonderful visual materials. And there's a lot of related material as well. Um, these are the three digitized Walt Whitman manuscript collections that we have available. Um, altogether, there's over 30,000 items, as I mentioned. And um, the easiest way to go to them is to go to the Library of Congress website you can click on the digital collections uh, button, search on Whitman, and you get these three uh, headers. And going into each one of these, there's a portal page. And one easy way to get to those is to use Google and just say, uh, Harned about this collection or Feinberg about this collection. And you'll go right to the, the um, home page for the digital presentation. Another way to access these, the digital um, presentations are set up to kind of mirror the way that you would use materials if you came into the library and were using them physically. So they're put online on a folder basis, not an item basis, but folder. So this is an example of the Charles Feinberg finding aid. And you can see that for every folder of con correspondence that's listed here, there's a hot link of digital content available. And you can click on that and it'll go right to as if you're opening that folder. And we even have a picture of the folder at the beginning. So it's basically you're doing what you would do if you were at a table at the library, but you're doing it at home or in the classroom through your computer. There are other ways to access the um, digital collections. And one way is through our LGBTQ um, guide. Um, this was done by my, my colleague, Loretta Deeper. And one of the things that um, it does is it shows about 20 other collections related to Whitman that are at the library, but aren't available online. And it puts Whitman in the context of other collections that we have, including Truman Capote, Edna St. Vincent Millay, and activists Frank Kameny and Lily Vincennes. We also have a Walt Whitman, what we call a lib guide in the library trade. And it lists the collection, but it also has other things about Whitman that are anywhere on the Library of Congress website. And these are very helpful for teachers too, that if you're assigning a project that has to do with primary documents, you might want to also look at a blog post on that topic or look at a webcast. And of course the webcast include, includes one of Karen talking at the library, so. And here's the, what we were just talking about, the By the People crowdsourcing transcription campaign. So there's the URL. You can go to just crowd.loc.gov and you're there. It's very easy to register. You just 
register with your email and a password. And then you can transcribe, you can tag significant subjects and names. And then we have a review process. So after many people have worked on the transcription and they say, I think I'm done. The review process is someone else coming in and taking a look. It's like the proofreading. And you can see there, we already have 1,301 contributors. And I hope at the end of the night, we have more. <laughs> How many do you need in total? Oh, we can have as many, potentially as many contributors and the projects just go faster the more people who are working on the materials. So, um, all right, listeners, you heard the call to arms here. <laughs> go for it. And this is what it looks like if you're inside by the people and you're looking at, this is a completed transcript. And it says, this transcript is finished. Um, so even after the projects are done and there's nothing more to transcribe and that you can still use these in the classroom because you can display them just like this, where you see the original on one side and the transcript that have been created on the other. And I chose this uh, for perhaps obvious reasons out from this mask, which was publishes out from behind this mask. I think it was first in the New York Tribune and then it was in two rivulets. But um, COVID has added a whole new layer of meaning to this. So in some ways, Whitman is playing with the idea of the mask uh, as a face covering the face itself as a mask, a mask as a ball or performance or a drama and how we are performing ourselves. And then these, these words, this common curtain of the face contained in me for me in you for you, in each for each. And doesn't that describe all of us walking in our masks in, in this day of COVID? So. I'll just point out Walt is wearing a mask behind me here. Yes, he is <laughs> He's being very good. <laughs> this is a document that's in the um, poetry series. And what it is is Whitman's notes on what he saw as the main themes in Leaves of Grass. And I often use this with teacher workshops and um, when I'm talking with students as a kind of starting point. Um, we're talking about robust love and he doesn't use those words, but those were, those synonyms are here. So, you know, there's physical health, the manly health, his concern with physique, um, his love of the body related also to open air nature, which is also expressed in poems like Brooklyn Ferry and democracy and comradeship. Uh, those are, you know, the body politic, uh, the amativeness and adhesiveness of, of people that make up comradeship and more uh, specifically the brotherhood, the kind of comradeship of the Calamus poems. And one of the themes here is the old and when I'm using this as a teaching device, we also look at, well, there are all these blanks here. Um, and what, would, what else would you add to this? Or if you were making a modern list of what Leaves of Grass is about, what, how would the terms be different? And also maybe some of the things that Whitman has left out. One of the themes being his old age, um, We've looked in classes about, you know, the changes in Whitman over time and, uh, you know, the contrast between his physique uh, as the carpenter image in 1855 and then his aging and that he becomes a poet of disability. And so sometimes when we do um, disability um, month displays, I include Whitman in those displays. And those pictures at the top, those are either ends the Freudian kind of either ends of the Calamus cane, which we have at the library that was a gift from John Burroughs to Whitman. And then we see him in, in later life in Camden with a cane that he's using um, to help him in a wheelchair. And then of course the picture on the far right is a very famous photograph of him literally sitting on top of a heap of manuscripts and newspapers. So we hope that some of those things in that heap that we see him sitting on, you know, were part of what went into the barrels and eventually are the archives that we are using today. 
We also have some artifacts in the collection and um, I've always been moved by Whitman's hands. We also have his eyeglasses. And I'll say you can't get the dimensions from this, but uh, when you see them, you're very struck. He had very large hands. And you think this is the hand that held the pen and this is the hand that caressed people that he loved. And the other thing that struck me about this is that, you know, down to the generations, we have these hands preserved and uh, Whitman's complexion and these hands are black and brown. He talks about hands in the poetry. This is a, a notebook entry from the Harnard Whitman collection where he talks about passing people on the street and, you know, being a walker in the city cruising um, and says, do you know what it is? Do you know what it is to have men and women crave the touch of your hand and the contact of you? And I think I chose that too. Again, the COVID longing that we all have of contact, yeah. So beautiful. Thank you, Barbara, for highlighting that, that moment. The, one of the special things we have at the library is a draft manuscript page of Song of Myself. And again, here he's talking about me going in for my chances, spending for vast returns, very sexual and sensual line, adorning myself to bestow myself on the first that will take me. And then one of his famous catalogs of the contralto, the carpenter, the married children going home for Thanksgiving, which we hope that people will not do this year, but um, in, for safety's sake, and also the fairy poet pilot. And this is Whitman, the, the poet of democracy. This is Whitman in another um, notebook, one of my favorite, it's called Women from the Harnard Whitman papers. You know, positing another kind of look at the body and it's at the, the enslaved man at auction and the enslaved woman at auction and the importance that they are not just themselves as individuals, but they carry within them basically the DNA and genetics of their ancestors and also the, the promise of the generations that they will produce through procreation. And so the, the, the worthiness of them as human beings is one point and the other is their place in this long continuum of, um, of humanity. Uh, this is of course, you know, very closely related and basically to icing the body electric. Other famous things that we have that we use a lot for classrooms and is the very famous trial lines from um, what's known as the Talbot Wilson notebook. And these are the lines of, I am the poet of slaves and of the masters of slaves. And I am the poet of the body and I am the poet of the soul. So it is that Whitman working with dichotomy, um, the resolution of dichotomy uh, and the materiality and the transcendence and also the status of slavery and of those who have enslaved others. Um, what he sometimes says, uh, describes as North and South. And, and then interestingly, it goes on to say, I'm the poet of strength and of hope. And we need strength and hope in these days. So I think we can read this you know, differently again in this year than we might have in other times. And he goes into you know, the uh, physical empathy that he has. And we know this is manifested later when he is visiting um, wounded and ill soldiers in the army hospitals in the Civil War. But the, the, the charisma that Walt Whitman had and the empathy that he brought to people who were compromised or ill or downtrodden and the ability to lift them up in his caregiving um, and in his attention to them. And he would often say, I'm penetrating them and um, taking them into myself. Um, in another Harnard Whitman notebook, uh, the women notebook, he also speaks about newly arrived immigrants. He's talking about German and Irish girls and boys. And he says, I am the poet of the shallow and the flat and despised. This is one of my favorite things. This is uh, one of the many notebooks that Whitman made. 
And the notebooks are all different kinds of things. And this is particular one is his notes for an intended American dictionary. And this is all about Whitman as a poet of the vernacular and using slang and everyday language. And he has this wonderful passage on the page on the right where he says, talk to everybody. And he doesn't say everybody one word, it's everybody, everywhere. So just talk and, and see how other people express themselves. And, um, and this was something that he was compiling, um, you know, partly because he was a wordsmith and of course all his poems are constructed of words, but um, also he was a deep studier of, of sources like the Bible and the classics and of dictionaries. But he has this little note here at the top where he, the, the idea behind this was, you know, the language behind the idea of creating an, a really truly American uh, democratic opera, which I hope that there are operas that are based on Whitman's work, but um, this opera is still to be written. So I'm hoping that's a kind of creative work that someone will do from the archives. The other example here is this little piece of clipping at the top. That's the backside of the illustration that you see in the book. So as he often would do, Whit Whitman would write sometimes on one side and make the other side a scrapbook or he would insert little clippings or, and um, so they are notebooks and they're also scrapbooks at the same time. We also have materials in the archives the move away from the body and more towards the soul that are about Whitman um, and his mysticism, the ideas of transcendence and transformation. And of course, a very famous item we have in the collections is the hearted Whitman butterfly, which was really a Victorian Easter card. And here he is pictured with it on his finger. The Crossing Brooklyn Ferry notebook um, has trial lines of the poems and many of the notebooks uh, contained the genesis of other poems, including the sleepers at Body Electric. And here he's talking about the, the, calling it a poem on passage. Of course, it would be called Sundown Poem and then Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. But the idea that he was in the beginning thinking of it as passage. Um, and he writes in specimen days about his love of rivers and the passage. We all have our favorite parts. This is one of mine. And this is his draft lines about the seagulls flapping their wings. And um, in the published poem, it comes out as the seagulls oscillating their bodies, fly on seabirds sideways or wheel in large circles high in the air. So it's part of that mystical, sublime, transcendent aspect of crossing Brooklyn Ferry. And Whitman, of course, used birds a lot as imagery in the poems. So there's the thrush, the eagle, the trumpeter swan. That's another exercise I've done with classes is looking at birds in Whitman's poetry and then looking up about those birds and why would he choose those particular ones as symbols for those poems. This is one of my favorite quotes from that notebook. In the best poems appear the human body, well-formed, natural, accepting itself, unaware of shame, loving that which is necessary to make it complete, proud of its strength, active, receptive, a father, a mother. And again, we have that sense of a kind of generative power that is that he often emphasizes in the poems. I'm gonna start skipping faster here because I know we have time limits and I want Wally to speak, but we have a lot of material about Whitman in the Civil War and that is a very high, um, uh, focus of interest for teachers, especially history teachers, um, who are doing sessions on the war in their classes. And here, this is a notebook on where he's talking about slavery, but he's really talking about, you know, the violence and the brutality, not being about what the slaves are experiencing in the institution of slavery, but the warfare itself as violent and bloody and what the mainly in his viewpoint, white soldiers are experiencing in the process of the war. And that would, once the war began, become the focus. Um, this is his Antietam notebook where he talks about the blood-soaked hay and the barn that was used for triage for the wounded. 
And there's a gardener photograph of the dead at Antietam. And he kept many hospital notebooks as the journalist that he was. And they're a real um, hodgepodge of information about the, the people that he met, what he observed, things that he was thinking about writing. Some of it he translated into newspaper articles and much of it he translated later into memoranda during the war. But on the right, these are sample pages from this where he has the names of some of the men that he had uh, met and their family members and ways to contact their family members and things that they might need. And an example of a letter that he wrote to parents of a Union soldier he became close to um, in the last days of his life to inform them that their son had a good death and a good death would be defined in the 19th century is that he was not alone, that he was brave, um, that he received the care that the doctors were able to give to him. And um, basically that Whitman had been a surrogate family member when for the family that wasn't able to be there. And I think about this too, that it has all kinds of new resonance now during COVID where so many people are being hospitalized and put on ventilators and perhaps passing away without their family members being able to be with them. In the crowdsourcing, we've done a lot of other Civil War material. So if you are a teacher that is doing Civil War, you can compare the Whitman materials to think letters from Lincoln and also materials from Clara Barton. Um, one of the wonderful things for Whitman that came out of the Civil War um, was at the very end in 1865, he meets the love of his life, Peter Doyle. And we have wonderful correspondence. Um, one of the uh, things about their relationship is that they were separated um, in the latter part of Whitman's life. And the good part of that is that we have letters that Whitman wrote to him. And I encourage people to go to these two folders in the Feinberg collection and read those letters. I wanted to close with um, some of my favorite things that are about Whitman's meeting with Oscar Wilde. This is another kind of notebook that we have in the collections and it's a commonplace book or a, a self-made day book. And you can see on, on the right, he's writing little notes on what he does um, on a daily basis. And on the left, he uses as scrapbook and an address book and for other purposes. And that's a little detail from the notebook at the top. And you'll see, he says on January 18th, Oscar Wilde here, but he doesn't give a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. Down on January 25th, he says that he writes to Harry Stafford and we have the letter to Harry Stafford. So I'm quite moved by, you know, whatever happened with the meeting with Oscar Wilde and there's a lot of conjecture. Um, we know certain details that they were met in the afternoon and that there was elderberry wine involved. But we do know for sure that just a week later, Whitman writes this very moving letter to Harry Stafford, who was a close companion at the time, and, um, and basically says there are unresolved things in our relationships that we have not talked about, and we should be talking about them. And then in that same context, he brings up, have you read about Oscar Wilde? And he's saying here, not that you've read Oscar Wilde's writing, but have you read about him in the newspapers as a celebrity on this lecture tour of the United States? And he describes him, his body as a fine, large, handsome youngster and adds a little dig at the end with the good sense to have a great fancy of me, <laughs> which of course he wished Harry would, would have this enthusiasm. And there are photographs of Harry and of Oscar Wilde from about the same time period and we might be able to say that Whitman had a type. <laughs> and I'll end on this letter, which is uh, the last page of a March 1882 letter from Oscar Wilde, where um, there's more detail to it that has to do with Swinburne and Victorian literature and the connections with Britain. But it has this lovely close of before I leave America, I must see you again. There's no one in this wide, great world of America whom I love and honor so much. Oh my and that lovely signature, Oscar Wilde. <laughs> it's a happy moment. And especially when we think of what happens with Oscar later in his life. Yeah. So.
Wow. Wow. Know, just stop share, right? Oh yeah. Just, uh, right. Exactly. Okay. There we are. A treasure trove. Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm sure Wally, you got some treats at the end for your, for your play. And I mean, what a, what a gift actually, Barbara, to hear your favorite moments in the archive. I, I know we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I'm actually kind of glad. And I hope that listeners will listen and listen again. I think my favorite quotation is from the notebook on the intended American dictionary, right? Talk to everybody. <laughs> it's so yeah. perfect. I, I mean, what a great slogan. Um, I want to move uh, very quickly to the assignment, Wally, and then maybe just have you, uh, and maybe we can run over. I know I've been trying to keep these talks to a manageable hour, but maybe like five minutes over, because I really want to hear uh, about your experience in the archive. Um, because it seems to have also shaped some of the things that you are planning for the future as well. You know, that plunge in the archive, you're doing that again with the, with the Wilde and Whitman play. So I'm going to share my screen right now and take everyone really briefly to the assignment itself. Um, as you see, it was called short project number one, what is it then between us? transcribing Whitman's notebooks at the Library of Congress. So I really took a lot of cues from Barbara's fine work uh, with the manuscripts division. And I asked my students to do a transcription of a page spread from the famous Crossing Brooklyn Ferry Notebook. And I do have that up here as well. Uh, this is how they would have viewed it and how you can view it from the Library of Congress digital collection. So you just press on here and you get all these wonderful page spreads. And what I wanted them to do was to pick out one page spread that they would really fixate on and concentrate their energies on. And I also asked for, just to go for the um, meat of it here, just a little introduction to the two page spread uh, using as many of the senses as possible because I think for me, um, one of the things I regret when I can't take my students to an actual archive is that reminder that the archive is a multi-sensual experience, right? You can touch things, you can smell things, uh, that you can't do online, um, but you could try to evoke it, right? So I, I tried to get them into that idea of, of a sensory experience. So they're kind of beginning with an introduction to the actual page spread. Then I asked for a transcription. And again, this is not so easy. I included, and I don't know if you ever use this, Barbara, but the Whitman Archives Whitman handwriting tool, which I find really fascinating. And uh, for those of you that are watching, you can obviously freeze this, you know, stop the, the uh, recording and, and go to the link and you'll see how useful this can be in, in deciphering that big scrawl. Um, and then the third part of their assignment was to connect the study of these pages to Whitman's finished poem. So remember, they're looking at the Crossing Brooklyn Ferry notebook. These are notes towards Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. Uh, so I was interested in hearing about how my students could see the beginnings, or maybe not, of that beautiful finished project. What have you learned? Uh, uh, sorry, what have you learned anything about the poem itself or Whitman's creative process or other historical or personal information that may be useful to your study of Whitman and 19th century American culture. And I asked them maybe to look at the document itself, um, the poem, to, to kind of like feed their imaginations. So with that in mind, um, my students submitted their essays and I'm just gonna call up here uh, Wally's submission, which was an absolute standout. And I'm gonna try and move us so we don't get in the way here. And Wally, since we're really, you know, pressed for time, and I apologize, you know, obviously we need to have two shows for, for or more for what we're trying to do with this one. Um, but can you kind of walk us through this? And I, and I can go where you want me to go in the essay uh, with how you kind of approach this idea of studying the notebook pages so closely and maybe um, what, what you got out of it, right? You, you obviously got some, some kind of, you know, good experience out of it because you're still using this idea. 
Um, I just loved even the layout of what you did. So Wally just showed very clearly what he was going to work on. He picked a very rich series of pages with a lot of the printer's indexes, which I am a personal fan of. And then you begin, and maybe I'll just, if you don't mind, Wally, I'll just read a little bit of the beginning to get us in this. Is that all right? Yes, please. I really, uh, he's obviously a consummate um, artist uh, of words, Wally. And you'll see that from the way that he begins to get you in the mindset of understanding this beautiful little uh, notebook. A maroon pocket-sized notebook. Its cover is damaged and distressed, its spine barely intact. Inside, its worn out round corner leaves are tinged in shades ranging from pale yellow to burnt brown. Faint cross-ruled lines with horizontal text lines and vertical red margin lines. In places, rough and jagged edges, and he's got images here, and torn cutouts. Patches of smudging and stains from mold, mildew, liquid spills, perspiration, and fingerprints. A sniff of that old book smell, a mixture of wood, grass, and burnt scents. A look inside reveals its contents. The on-the-go pencil scribbles made in rough cursive handwriting. Scribbles of private musings, observations, appointments, self-reminders, personal contact details, drawings of maps, ideas for poems and trial lines of passages. The personal notebook of a New York writer and poet. And Barbara, I see you smiling because I know what you're thinking, what I'm thinking. Is this Walt? Has Walt already rubbed off on Wally, the listing and, you know, even some words that we will remember from the poems themselves. So Wally, I love it, right? This is more than just an analysis. This is a creative work as well. Um, and you spent quite a bit of time introducing us to the actual piece and then got into the transcription. So do you have any words about the, the kind of experience of this? Yeah, I mean, it was so immersive. I've never done um, anything like this, even though I've taken a lot of English classes. You know, I don't think a lot of professors really have us engage with, um, you know, author's notebooks and getting into the creative process. So as a, as a writer, it was great to be able to, to see uh, Whitman's mind at, at work here, really. Um, and I think this assignment was great in that it brought out kind of both the creative side of me as well as the analytical side. And so uh, that first part, you know, your instructions of, you know, describe, describe the, the, the notebook using as many descriptive terms as possible, um, which is something that all uh, prof writing professors ask their students to do, right? It's like describe using all possible senses. And in this case, even though we weren't able to be there in person to, to feel and smell the, the notebook, um, you encouraged us to, to use our imagination, right? Um, what would a notebook like this um, feel like, smell like? Um, and so that was just like a really immersive exercise uh, for me. Um, and then the transcription part, I have to say, like admit that like coming into that, I always thought transcription was such like a rote exercise. It seems like something maybe like you assigned to, to younger kids, um, but having to transcribe this, um, I think re re really requires full engagement with the text. And I think Barbara mentioned this also earlier is um, you're like questioning every single squibble and, and trying to make sense of it and, and putting yourself in the mind of, of the writer. And, and we got this assignment kind of later on in, in the class. So it was good to like be in Whitman's mindset already to be somewhat familiar with his handwriting and pen penmanship. So be able to, to, to make that out. So yeah, well, and as you can see, I still have a lot of question marks uh, here, uh, but that's that's maybe the point of it is that uh, we're not gonna be able to, to get all the answers, but let's keep, keep searching and, and digging and then see what comes out of it. 
I think, uh, yeah, I love that you left that room in there. Um, and I also like just following this transcription in the analysis section and, and everyone forgive my scrolling, um, don't get dizzy looking at the screen, but I'm going down to Wally's comparison chart as you see here, he developed a table. Below is a side-by-side -side comparison table of the trial lines in Whitman's notebook and the first published version of the Sundown poem that appeared in the second edition of Leaves of Grass. So I thought that this took the lesson even a bit further, right? You really went out of your way to show how the beginnings of the ideas were related to the final version, right? That first iteration of Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, known as Sundown Poem. Um, was there anything that stood out for you on like the what the notebook said and then what the final product did? I think I just confirmed two things that I, I, I know instinctively writers should do is one is, is writing is an iterative process, right? We're always constantly editing and moving things around. So, so we see that. And then two, um, that writing is, people say writing is both communicative and generative, right? That the communicative part is like, we're trying to transfer what's in our mind on paper. That's the communication part. But the generative part is just by writing, the act of writing itself can generate ideas. And I think we really see that here is as Whitman was writing um, and gathering his thoughts and generating ideas. So um, it's good to know that, you know, even a great poet like Whitman has to do extensive editing um, and that, you know, the first draft is, is never perfect and it's just the, the germ for, for what's to come. Such wonderfully helpful uh, words for writers out there. There's just one more thing I wanted to show off and I could go on and on about Wally's work, but I actually really love the appendix totally unnecessary and totally showing me that you were totally into it. So you included an annex of additional images. Do you have a favorite that I should be showing here? <laughs> Page through them slowly, but you've got so many wonderful little observations because obviously you went out of your way here. You weren't just looking at the page spread, but really at all of the details of how the notebook was put together. I would just say this is an example, I think, of, of one of the advantages of a digital copy it is being able to zoom in and then take these screenshots um, and can carry and encourage us to do this. And then Barbara had showed this during her presentation um, just to the class when, when you asked her to come and be the guest speaker for that. So it was great to, to zoom in. And yeah, this image three of, of this stain blob, um, you can kind of see like it looks like a fingerprint of, of sorts. And I'm just like, it just, you know, I could just feel um, Whitman's thumb. The there. actual presence of the, the body of the poet as Barbara was saying before. And, and I think Whitman often left these partly because he was responsible for printing so much. So in uh, various copies of Leaves of Grass, maybe you've seen this too, Barbara, in, the, in LC's versions of things, but I know that I've seen thumbprints, you know, index fingerprints, and I guess there's a 50-50 chance it could be Walt in the 1855, either him or uh, Andrew Rome. Um, but here, yeah, quite possibly Whitman's, the very hand of the poet in there. And I see that you got to know him well enough to know that three underlines was actually pretty strong stuff for Walt. Yeah, I, we didn't talk about this, but you know, half one side of the the spread that I chose, it, it's his philosophy on writing. And that's such, such like a gem to find, you know, it's not only the trial lines for his poems, but he's telling us his writing philosophy. Um, and that's amazing. I'm just thinking like, you know, now we're all using computers and, and iPhones, et cetera, for our note taking. So it's sad that, you know, in the future, we might not have these records to, to look at. So, um, just to, to appreciate what we, what we do have here. And um, what you've given in this assignment is, is clear to anyone who's looking at it. And it's also clear that there's so much to be learned from the manuscript that you can't possibly get just from the finished draft of the, of the poem. So it feels to me, Wally, that you really got to know Walt, right? Like 
Uh, there's a real insight into the creative process that made the poem, but also maybe even more of a knowledge of the poet himself. Yeah, I like to say, you know, the summer class I had, I felt like I was having a summer fling with, with Whitman, uh, <laughs> really getting intimate with, with him. And interesting, you know, when Barbara sent me this, this signed copy of Leaves of Brass, I believe, and it had uh, at Oscar Wilde's, um, writing on it, and, and as well as Whitman's. So I was very familiar with Whitman's handwriting. I felt like, yeah, of course, that's it. But Oscar Wilde's, it was the first time I had seen his writing. And I was like, whoa, what, what is this? Just being disoriented by, <laughs> by the handwriting. So it was just interesting to see the juxtaposition there of like somebody I'm very familiar with now and somebody who I'm just getting to know. It is a form of intimacy, right? And that, uh, that wonderful feeling of connection when you recognize the handwriting. I mean, something that is becoming more and more rare for us on a daily basis. But thanks to the Library of Congress and to Barbara's efforts there, I mean, we have this ability to keep connecting with writers through these primary documents. Wally and Barbara, thank you so much. I wish I wouldn't have to say goodbye, or at least I wish we could go out for some kind of celebration together and have a toast to Walt. We will hold that thought for a few more months. Um, but meanwhile, I had such a good time. Thank you so much both for being here today. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. Well, we'll use Whitman's poem title, So Long. <laughs> Very good. Okay. <laughs> good night, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're off next week, as you remember, but please come in two weeks for Barbara Henry and the Poet Printer.